And I just had this sudden understanding <laughs> that all of us have challenges and all of us are suffering on whatever end of the spectrum. And that movement is such a healing part of that. Welcome to the Juggling the Chaos of Recovery podcast, where we focus on health and wellness and overcoming all types of addictions. You're in the right place if you're a mom, dad, sibling, or caregiver who has a loved one who is or was struggling with an eating disorder or any other kind of addiction. In a time where everything seems heavy, I'm here to bring you a very real yet lighthearted take on what the heck we're all supposed to do with our lives while we care for our loved ones who are struggling. One thing holds true throughout it all. You can't juggle the chaos without smiling, at least a little bit. Well, welcome back. This is Moira, uh, your podcast host. I'm so excited that, again, I'm always, I always like to start my podcast by just with a full dose of gratitude that you come back and listen. And um, I am so really excited today about my guests that I'm bringing to you because I feel like the universe continues to work in my favor. And as you know, as you continue to listen to this podcast that I've started to dance and I'm learning so much about myself and about dance. My guest today happens to have a real love of dance, and that's part of her business and part of her her story, and she found me, and I think that that's really awesome. So today I'm going to bring, uh, we're going to have a conversation, a fun conversation with Ioana Abumitri, and uh, she is a, um, again, a wonderful soul. She's a mother of three daughters. She has a wonderful story. She has a, um, a wellness business called Kilani right? Mm -hmm. a Poly yeah, a Polynesian inspired wellness business. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about dance. Um, I just love her soul that's filled with love. And part of her mission is to just spread that love. And as she will tell you, it's spread a loop, no, spread uh, alofa, uh, right? Yes. <laughs> alofa. So um, spread love in uh, Samoan language. So today, before I stumble over any more words here, <laughs> uh, please, um, I just welcome you today, uh, Ioana. I'm really thrilled that you're here with me today. Thank you so much, Moira. Thank you so much for that magical, beautiful intro. <laughs> and I'm so glad and honored to be on your show. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And don't the stumbling of the words, there's a lot of phonetical, <laughs> yeah. phonetical situations. So I absolutely understand that. But thank you so much for having me on, on the show. I really appreciate being yeah, here. You're, you're welcome. I'm, I really, um, I love that you reached out. Um, Again, the, the, you know, a big mission of this podcast is to share others' stories because our stories matter. And um, if it matters to one person or to 100 people or more, you know, our stories do matter. And we want to offer hope to those that are struggling with eating disorders, addictions, um, just other things that have a grasp on them in life. And you have a story in that arena and, um, and a lifelong journey, which many people just go on so long, you know, struggling and things like that. And you've had some wonderful realizations and you've written a book and again, continue to want to share that, that mission of hope. So let's start as I always do. Let's start with your story. Um, again, I know it's been a lifelong journey of disordered eating, but um, yeah, let's start by talking about that. You sharing your journey in, um, in that disordered eating world. Yes, thank you so much for offering this platform. As you prefaced, it is important to share our stories in um, in the effort to create hope and, as you said, possibly inspiration. So my story is basically that I had what I call a scale addiction. So I uh, had been addicted to the scale for 30 plus years. The earliest documentation that I found of it was a journal that I had when I was about 12, 13 years old. And I came across this about a year ago. And in the journal, I was saying, dear, whatever, I call the journal a name, <laughs> dear, whatever. Um, I'm so excited because um, so-and-so, a family member of mine was paying me money to lose weight. And Moira, you have a daughter <laughs> and I have three, and I can't even imagine what it would be like for me to be paying my daughter's money to lose weight. My heart just shattered into a million pieces, but I'm not here to put blame or shame. So this is really important. A real important part of my journey has been to understand that it's not 
my fault and it's nobody else's fault either. Everybody who has been part of this journey and our journey has come here as a result of many different things, nature, nurture, hundreds of years of programming and whatever it is. Anyway, I digress. So 30 years, I have been um, very, very obsessed. The scale is just a small part of it. The scale is just indicative of, of my behavior and what, what I was doing, which I determined was basically judging myself needing that external validation, needing to hear that I'm worthy from other people. And I did that through my aesthetics. And from a very young age, I thought that how I looked, it was a representation of how valuable I was. And that became my story up until maybe uh, a few months ago, literally. And and the, the ironic thing is I've been in the wellness industry for about 20 years. And that's why I got into the industry because I wanted to understand what uh, weight cycling was, what yo-yo dieting meant. I became a holistic nutritionist as a result. But the irony of the situation is once you enter the wellness and the fitness world, <laughs> if you don't understand the, the mechanics of your brain and what got you there in the first place, it can actually catapult you even further into this judgment, into the space of, am I good enough? Am I good enough to be a wellness professional? Am I good enough to be a personal trainer? Am I good enough to be a studio owner? And, and the, the interesting thing is I thought that because I didn't, I wasn't anorexic or that I didn't throw up or that I didn't do all those, you know, maybe stereotypical ideals that people have of eating disorders that I didn't have one. I thought, okay, I weigh myself. What's the big deal? But fast forward to 2020, which was just a few months ago, right? <laughs> the international pandemic and I'm at home and I, I was eating and, you know, I'm an emotional eater. So I was looking to food for nurturing as I do when I started to gain weight. And I thought, okay, well, I've gained weight. I'm going to do the usual thing. Cause then the only reason I know that I've gained weight is that I've stepped on the scale as I do obsessively. And I thought, um, well, I'll just diet again. I'll just crash diet. That's what I do. It's what I always do. It's what I've always done. What's the big deal. But there was something different more this time in that I just felt tired. I just felt emotionally tired. I felt psychologically tired. I felt, you know, in my book, I put that I felt expired. I just felt like I had reached my best before date. I've been yo-yo dieting my entire life. This is 30 plus years. And I was like, I'm done. And I thought, okay, I'm a wellness professional. I could do this. No big deal. So I decided I wasn't going to fat diet anymore. I wasn't going to do any extreme dieting. I wasn't going to do any restrictions. I wasn't going to do any of that. But when you decide to do that, the interesting thing is, is that the scale is still there judging you. So I was eating healthier. I wasn't like, I wasn't crash dieting or anything like that, but I was still stepping on the scale and it was still not showing me the results that I wanted. So it was kind of a dichotomy because I wanted to be healthier, but I was still stepping on the scale. So again, I didn't actually even put two and two together. I'm, in I'm a relatively intelligent person, but I still didn't get it. And then I, one day, October 12th, to be very specific, I sat there and I felt like every single issue that I've ever had psychologically all came crashing onto me like a mountain. What do you call that game? Jenga, I guess, you know, where you stack oh, yeah, up all those yeah. things. With yeah. The, yeah. Right. Yes. I was thinking of that analogy, the metaphor. I felt like somebody had pulled the very bottom part and everything just came collapsing onto me. It just seemed like every, so many different issues all at once, you know, things with this and that and the other. So I contacted, I have a brain retraining coach and she's amazing because I just think that the brain is so powerful. And I contacted her and we had, you know, a two hour conversation and without boring your listeners, the bottom line of the conversation was that all the issues in my life are circled around my judgment, my feeling less than, my feeling not worthy, and my feeling not valuable. And I got off the phone call and I thought, huh, I wonder if the scale is related to that in any way. So then I thought, okay, what happens when I step on the scale? And just to just 
side side note this for a second for your listeners to understand because some people are like what's the big deal I weigh myself um I don't just weigh myself I didn't used to just weigh myself I used to weigh myself in an obsessive compulsive way I'm not a psychologist so I'm not allowed to technically self-diagnose however if you Google obsessive compulsive disorder, and then you see what I did. It is exactly the same. I would step on this scale completely naked. I would literally take off anything on my body, including a hair tie, a ring, whatever there was. And I would step on this scale and I wouldn't like what the digital reading would say. And I would step on it again. And I would step on it again. And I would step on it again. Anywhere up to maybe 20 or 30 times, I would step on this scale And then I would start to judge myself if the number's gone up or if it hasn't gone down. And then I would think of different strategies to step on this scale to affect the number on this scale. Now, it's funny because when I wrote about it, I thought, oh my goodness, I can't believe that I did all those things. But when you're in it, when you're in a behavior, you think it's absolutely quote unquote normal. And it was normal for me at the time because I've been doing this for 30 years. So I would step on this scale and I would figure out the exact placement of the scale between the tiles of my bathroom to make sure that the number on the scale would be affected in the way that I wanted to be affected. I would lean on the wall in a certain way to make sure that the number on the scale would be affected in a way that I would want the number to show up on the scale. I would not shower because I was convinced, and I'm so curious actually, that when I shower, (laughs) the water would absorb into my skin and affect the number on my scale. I would not eat or drink before I stepped on this scale. So if I didn't want to shower till five o'clock in the afternoon or the evening, guess what would happen, Moira? I just wouldn't eat or drink until five o'clock in the evening. I would do amazing things things to affect the number on this scale. I was a personal trainer for many years. I knew all the tricks. I would dehydrate my body. I would put myself into all these competitions. And I remember uh, somebody bet me that I would lose 10 pounds by a certain amount of time. The day before the weigh-in, I completely dehydrated myself. I was working at a gym. I went into the sauna. And for anybody listening, please don't ever do this. It's bad enough to be dehydrated. It's even worse to be dehydrated and go into a sauna that is very dangerous. And then I stepped on the scale the next day. And the number was a quote unquote success. I don't know why I'm air quoting. Nobody can see me, but I'm air quoting folks. If if you're wondering what's going on. And unfortunately that enabled the behavior. I thought I am successful. I I lost the weight. Great. I'm going to continue all these behaviors. Anyway, fast forward again to 2020. I thought about all those behaviors. I thought every time I'm stepping on the scale, I am judging myself. And because I thought that it would be better that I judge myself than other people judging me, because of course they're going to judge me based on the way that I look. Of course, like that was a, a given for me. So I contacted her again, <laughs> my brain coach. And I said, what if I stopped weighing myself? She said, uh, yeah, definitely do that. And Moira, w- without going into too, too, too much detail, what happened after that was so October 12th, I contacted her. October 14th, I decided to stop weighing myself cold turkey. (laughs) And the the epiphanies that happened after that were next level, mind-blowing, aha moment, life-changing, all of that. So that's where I am today. Uh, It's really, it is amazing. And um, I've never heard anybody's story like that. Um, Yet I know that... um, there's probably a lot of people listening that can relate to what you're saying. And I know that when I was in my eating disorder in college, I had a scale in my closet and I weighed myself every day and probably two, three times a day and things like that. We're talking about eating disorders here, but I I just got to thinking like, sometimes it's a scale. Sometimes it's something else, right. That gives us that worth. Maybe it's our really fancy car or our, our house or the ring that we're showing off or whatever. We all have those type of things that we put this false sense of something on so that we will, you know, feel like you said, valuable enough And that we're okay. And I also remember having, um, speaking with one of my clients and friends one day who, and she's overweight and she was on her weight loss journey and to just get healthier and because things weren't well with her health. And, um, but she was, she's all, she's always like bubbly and talkative and stuff like that. And I remember her saying, well, I might as well cut myself down first 
because I get a chance to do that mm-hmm. first before someone else does. Yeah. So I thought about that as you said that, like we might as well devalue ourselves because or judge ourselves because everybody else is going to, right? In a exactly. negative way. So we might as well do that first, which is just so sad. And I believe super common, commonplace, yeah. you know, for so many. Absolutely. Absolutely. And going back to what you were saying about getting that worth from from different sources, that's basically what my issue was throughout my entire life. I was trying to seek all of those things externally, not realizing as we we know intellectually that everything that we need, all our true joy, all our true happiness, all our worth and value comes from ourselves. And I thought always that I needed to hear it from somebody else. Otherwise it wasn't true. Like I can't possibly be valuable if somebody doesn't tell me I'm valuable. That was that was the wiring of my brain my entire life. So yeah, it's a vicious circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that a little bit more later too. It's so, so true. And again, I'm always amazed. Like every time I do one of these podcasts, I'm like, oh, I needed to hear that today. Oh, I needed to hear that today. <laughs> so, um, and like you said, we have daughters and there's just a terrible diet culture and, you know, beauty and vanity and like all of this stuff. I mean, how do you, how do you, talk with your daughters or share things? I mean, I'm assuming that, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't assume, but are you sharing this with your daughters and, you know, that what you're learning and, and how are you, you know, talking with them so that, you know, so that they can learn to maybe do things a little bit differently in their life? Yeah. Well, your assumption is absolutely spot on. I do talk about them uh, to talk about them. I do talk about them too, but I talk <laughs> with them <laughs> about everything that I do. I talk to them throughout the process of my book. I talk to them about everything that I do. They're very much involved in, in all of this process and all of my journey. Uh, first of all, they're not on social media and I, that's, that's just my own decision. That's my personal decision. And what I believe, uh, Moira, is that as I had said that everything that we need is inside of us, all the joy, all the happiness. Unfortunately, we have multi-billion dollar industries that know how to target all the parts of our brain, the dopamine receptors and all those kinds of happiness, serotonin, like all those things. They know how to target those and have our young people believe that happiness equals insert whatever it equals um, how you look equals how much money you have equals, you know, how many followers you have. So I think that as much as possible with our daughters, with ourselves, with our community, I always think of myself and people as radio stations and dialing in to our higher selves and dialing the noise out. So as much as possible, if you can dial the noise out, or if I can with my daughters is what I try to do, and then dial into the, the, the sounds that I want them to hear. So we talk a lot about, they're part of everything since, since the beginning of my, the inception of my wellness business. So about meditation, higher self, what true value is, higher purpose, service, gratitude. We do gratitude practices every single day of our lives. So I think, I think first and foremost is for your children to do as you do, not as you say, as we, we all know. Um, so they've, they've seen me doing this. I, I do this um, all the time. And then just constantly letting them know that they're valuable and that they're worthy and that everything that they don't need to hear that from anybody else. They don't even t- need to hear that from me. They are the source of all their value and all all of their and all of their worth. So again, just trying to have them dial into the things that I want them to dial into and dial out the outside noise. And I think that as parents, that's that's part and parcel of the reason that our children stay with us up until the age of whatever it is, 18 or whatever age, um, because their brains are so impressionable and and they're still forming their identity and in that time if we can help to prevent them from being exposed to all those outside noises um then i think that that's that's important yeah definitely and you know if they are exposed to those outside noises helping you know being here to help to guide them and help them decipher what all of that you know means and um i love that you know I love that analogy and that visual of the, the dialing, um, dialing in and, you know, know that if you're listening, 
like you said earlier, it's easier said than done yeah. because, you know, I'm 57 and um, I've had a, you know, I'm happy. I've had a wonderful life and all that, but there's been a lot of that. I'm not enough. I'm different. I want to, and maybe you don't see that I'm different and appreciate me for my uniqueness. You know, there's a lot of that. I'm not valuable. I'm not enough. I'm not, you know, I'm not like that. So there's something wrong. I mean, there's been that programming in my brain for many, many years. Mm. And so I say that because listeners may be saying, oh, it sounds really easy, but it's not. And it Mm. takes a lot of practice and it takes, sometimes it does take you working with somebody and a therapist that can help you, you know, help you kind of pull that out and realize that because that's certainly what's happened. That's what's helped me is for me to do that inner child work and to, you know, even figure out what that means with your inner child work. And you can, I've had therapists call it different things and going Mm -hmm. back and think, you know, whatever you want to call it, but just kind of identifying and kind of um, connecting with kind of who you were as you grew up and some of Mm -hmm. those, because that's, that's when it starts, right? Mm -hmm. That's when that programming starts. That's when those thoughts start and they just get embedded and it's hard to break that, but Mm -hmm. it's so true. Like that's where, that's where the love is it's it's within us and we Mm -hmm. it really doesn't it doesn't matter what anybody else says we've got to start here and connect with with ourself and our love and and all that um so let's talk a little bit about so you so you have a love for dance and you kind of incorporate that into your your wellness practice um you know tell us and you know your so your background is well tell us where you're from Okay. And kind of that native, you know, kind of, again, just let's talk about that, the dance and your background and how that kind of, I guess, came into being or, um, and we'll just, we'll talk about dance now. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I would love to. Thank you. Uh, So my mother is from the island of Samoa in the South Pacific. It's next to Hawaii. It's Hawaii's neighbor. And uh, she's part of a royal family there. So my grandfather was a paramount chief of a region there. My father is Greek, Egyptian, Turkish, Lebanese. So I always make jokes that when I was born, uh, God was like, well, you've got to shake your hips. Like there's no way you can (laughs) Every single hip shaking part of my DNA is alive and well between the Polynesian dancing and, you know, the Middle Eastern and everything. Uh, The funny part of the story is that I grew up extremely awkward and um, very uncoordinated, two left feet and then low self-esteem. I told you that that's part of the journey, right? It's like always judging myself as you just prefaced. So I was a person that shied away from any kind of movement, any kind of activity, any kind of perform, any of that kind of stuff. Standing on stage, no thank you. You know, all of those things seemed extremely far off and far-fetched and daunting to me. Now, fast forward to 2007. At the time I was in the wellness world and I was and still am a Pilates instructor. Uh, So my mom moved to Canada, I'm in Canada, from um, New Zealand, and she started to teach me some Polynesian dancing. Now her and her sisters and her family, actually her her cousin and best friend and brother formed a troupe called the Royal Polynesian Review back in the 70s. It was actually formed by my namesake, my auntie Ioana, who used to teach dance at the University of Auckland. And so she formed the troupe and they went on a world tour for about five years. Now, the unique thing about their troupe is that in the Polynesian world, so for anyone listening, Polynesia is a grouping of islands in the South Pacific, which includes Hawaii, Tahiti, Fiji, New Zealand, just a whole bunch of different islands. Every island has its own dance, has its own story, has its own culture, has its own history, has its own lineage, has its own everything. The the unique thing about my aunt's troupe is, and my family's troupe, is that they knew the dances of many of the islands. So they knew the Samoan dancing, which is called the Samoan Siva. They knew the Tahitian dancing, which is very much hips. Uh, They knew the Maori, which is from New Zealand. They knew um, the Hawaiian dancing, the hula. So they were very well versed. They also played the drums. They recorded an album. They sang, they played instruments. So they were just, they were literally the whole package. So they traveled around the world and spread the spirit and culture of my ancestors, just as I'm doing. So my mom started to teach me some of the dancing. And I believe we were standing in a park with my daughters at the time. And I was on the sand and I was thinking, huh, this is interesting with the hips. And I thought, 
there's some, fe- I'm feeling the feels, but I don't understand what this is. Like this is back in 2007. I didn't understand conceptually what was happening. I was just like, this is, this feels great. And I'm connected to this in a way that I've never been connected to any kind of dance or anything before. And then I was commenting that the Polynesian dancing is very similar to Pilates in the use of the core muscles. You know, you dance more, so you understand the center and the the center line and the core is essential in, in a dance practice. So I thought, why don't I just try to combine both disciplines together? So I combined Pilates and Polynesian and I called it Kelani Fusion. It's my two daughters' names, Keona, which means God's gracious gift, and Lelani, which means heavenly flower. Together they form Kelani, which means of the heavens. I didn't know that until afterward. And and so it was just half an hour of Pilates and half an hour of pure Polynesian dancing or something. As time went on, something happened in in that every time I was alone practicing the movements, listening to music, channeling my, my islands, I felt something so much deeper than just the aesthetics of the movement, than just the mechanics of the movement. I felt emotional. I felt transported. It was a very trance type of feeling that I had. So I started to create my own movements inspired by the islands. So I lived in Samoa for three years. And, uh, you know, I, we went to the beach all the time. We lived on the mountains, overlooking the ocean, all of that. And so it, any experience that I had, I incorporated into Kelani. Fast forward to 2016, I believe, and I had a fundraiser for mental health and a whole bunch of people came and we were sitting in a dark room. It was a glow in the dark event. And I was talking to them about mental health and how people suffer in silence. And I looked around the room and I realized it was kind of like an epiphany that everybody in the room looked like they're about to bawl their eyes out, like everybody was suffering. And I just had this sudden understanding (laughs) that all of us have challenges and all of us are suffering on whatever end of the spectrum. And that movement is such a healing part of that. And so over the years, through tons of research, because I knew it intuitively, just as a lot of people will know intuitively, but I've discovered that dance has a very big healing element and much more so and specifically the hip area, because that's where we carry trauma. That's where we carry emotions. That's where we, uh, that's where things can get stuck and creating flow in that area really helps with that healing process. This is the the area um, for the listeners at home. I'm putting my hand on my belly. So (laughs) (laughs) this is the area where we, you know, we create life where this is where, you know, we hold, you know, our, our, immune function. This is where our second gut is like so much is happening down in this area. Imagine if it's stagnant and stuck, what's happening with the rest. And I think that our bodies and our minds and our spirits and our souls are so connected and always wanting to create flow. And when you get that flow starting with this area or involving this area, it's just so powerful. Yeah. Well, yeah. And Again, I love, I'm so excited to talk about this because it's so much good stuff in there. And as, you know, listeners have heard, and I've talked to you about it prior to this is that, you know, I just decided to start dancing and it's becoming, I'm learning that it's become a healing, it's becoming a healing journey for me. It's fun, but it's also uncovering you know, some hurts and some pains. And um, as I'm learning the steps and doing the things, I'm realizing that there's, there's heal, there's realization in there and there's some healing going mm-hmm. on in there. And, um, and I wonder too, like, I do love the smooth dancing, um, meaning that the waltz and the foxtrot and the tango and the Viennese waltz is like my new favorite. And I'm like, and when I did my competition a couple of weeks ago, like I didn't, I just entered smooth. I didn't enter any of the rhythm, uh, the rhythm day. And uh, somebody says, why, honey, didn't you do the rhythm? I'm like, oh, I'm not Mm -hmm. ready for that. And they're like, oh, yes, you are. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. But it's, and it's a challenge for me um, Mm. to do the hips. And I mean, if you've seen ballroom dance and I mean, to be able to get the hip back and it's just like, it's like so unnatural. I'm like, they're like, you can do it. Just keep practicing. You'll be able to, and one thing I wanted to say too, is I've done a lot of yoga in my life, well, in the last probably 10 years or so. And as I was introduced to yoga, um, 
by uh, a good someone who became a very good friend of mine, Lauren Nosek. You can find her episode on this podcast too. Um, But she introduced me to yoga and the presence of just being present with yoga, but how there's so much emotion in your hips. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we would do the pigeon pose at the end. And how many times did I start crying when I was in pigeon? And it's like, what is going on there? But there's so much trapped, like you said, I believe there is so much trapped in our hips. And by doing things like yoga or by dance, we can start to, right, open that up. Release, yeah, release release it. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I know I have such a, I don't know, I don't know, I just, I guess I should say it because that's what came up. I mean, I have such a fear of that. And I don't know, I mean, I think part of it is my conservative upbringing and like we didn't, not that we weren't allowed to dance, but it was almost like doing that kind of dance and moving your hips and doing all that was, I don't know. It, yeah. It, what, you know, it wasn't good. It was yeah. kind it was of shunned. a form. It, yeah. And it was yeah. a form of you're showing yourself off and you should be, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be covering yourself or not being, you know? Yes. Yes. I would love to touch on that if that's okay. Sure, please do. Yes, yes. So in both my ancestry, as I told you, um, the Middle Eastern and in the Polynesian, uh, dance was always a sacred part of everyone's life. You know, in the Middle East, the women um, used to teach dance to their daughters to understand how to connect to their bodies because it was an important part of, of understanding your body. You need to understand your body. You need to understand even your reproductive organs. It's important to understand that it's not taboo. Also, dance back then was done with the women, for the women, for each other, to revere each other, to uplift each other, to to celebrate each other. It was not done as a performance. You know, it was not done as a sexual thing. And I think that the uh, the stigma or the fallacy is that though the hips are connecting to our sexual sexuality, which um, can also be connected to, you know, Mother Earth, but that's it's in a beautiful, um, sacred way because our reproductive organs create life. It's not done for show. It's not done to, t- to um, you know, to be provocative. You know, also back in Polynesia back in the day, hula um, was a very sacred practice as well. It was something that was taught from mother to daughter to granddaughter. From you know, it's it's something that's passed down from lineage to lineage to lineage, and when uh, people came to the islands and saw the hula, they thought that it was something that was dirty, that it was just everything that you're saying, right? Just this fallacy that if you're moving your hips, then it's a dirty thing. And, and so hula had to go into hiding. Hula went into hiding, that's funny. So it had to go into hiding and it just came out like 200 years ago or so when it, people discovered that, oh, it's actually a sacred practice. It's not, it's not dirty, it's not all those things. So I understand that. And I'm just gonna go back to what you said earlier on about yourself and um, going back to your inner child for healing and things like that. I think what people need to understand, going back to what I said at the very beginning of this about it not being our fault, Everything that, that that we are, the people that we are, are a result of nature and nurture, as we know, but also of generations and generations and generations and generations. And that could include generational trauma. And, you know, uh, biases, negative or positive, are passed down through our DNA. So if you think of somebody that was that struggled, be it your grandmother, your great mother, great grandmother, great great grandmother, That's been passed down to you. So that's why it's important. And you probably know this to go back and uh, to understand, you know, you can be sitting here and go, well, I had the most fabulous life ever. My parents were great. I went to a great school. I had food and I had shelter. And I'm not talking about you, but you can sit there and go, oh my goodness, why am I so miserable? Why am I so angry? Why am I so depressed? There's so much, there's so much. So when we say that people are unique, it's not only unique in your lifetime, me as a 43 year old, it's me and my ancestors and my ancestors before that, what have they passed down to us? And once we discover that, well, what can we do? That's why they talk about breaking cycles and breaking, you know, and stopping and understanding and then seeing what we can do so that we can stop the cycle. Let's stop the cycle of the shaming, this body shaming. Body shaming, you know, didn't happen hundreds of years ago. Women were revered in whatever way they looked and whatever body shape and size they came in. Somewhere along the line, and I don't know when exactly that is, somebody decided to impose their ideals of beauty onto us. And so that it was impossible for us 
to be perfect anymore. It was impossible for us to be this thing that we thought that we had to be. And that's carried on. And so we are constantly in the state of judging ourselves and being less than as women, as people in general, but specifically for women because of this projection from somebody else of how we should be, how we should look, how we should talk, how we should act, how we should sound. And that's just wreaked havoc. So I know I'm sounding really um, excited right now, but not excited, very passionate, but I really want to break the cycle for our daughters. We talked about this, like we need for them to understand that it's not all those things. Like you are beautiful, perfect and complete and whole the way you are right now, right? This second, the way that you were born the way that you are made, you're perfect. So it's also related, but yeah, dance is a huge part of it for sure. I love that. And I love that explanation because I didn't know that. And um, I love that. Like we should get, I love that, that image that I got in my head about like the women getting their daughters together and the grandmothers and they're learning to dance because they're, and it's, they're doing it, you know, for themselves, but for the women. Again, I think that's part of my, my little bit of hang up is that, that idea that when you're dancing this way, whatever this way is with my air quotes, um, <laughs> but it's provocative. It's, it's yeah. you know, suggestive to a male. And really that's not what dance, there's certainly some of that. And even as Dimitri's told me about, like, if you talk about, um, he's like, oh, you know, the salsas, I, I forget what it's like, you know, the salsas, like, you know, you come into the bar and talk to somebody and then there's the Roomba and they're like, oh, I will. And, you know, it goes, it gets down to the bachata and that's like, OK, let's go to bed. You know, so there is kind of like that provocative type of progression, if you will. Yeah. You know, the more the more sensuality, you know, not yeah. that it has to lead to that. But it was it was funny that um, he was kind of explaining that, you know, to before because we were talking about the origin yeah. of certain dances and that helps you understand them. Again, yeah. not that you have to be that it has to be a dirty thing, but it's mm-hmm. just like you said, to understand the hula or the other dances, to understand that origin mm-hmm. helps you be, to, to learn it better, I think. Yeah. And to know that it's okay to, you're doing this because you're, you know, whatever it is, you know? Yeah, um, for sure. But um, I, I love that. And I, I feel like we should all have some dance parties with moms and daughters and grandmothers and things yes. like that and and get back to that mm-hmm. because I love that that imagery and that that form then of acceptance mm-hmm. and acceptance of dance but except really acceptance of the female body yes. and that it's not to be looked at as dirty or Mm -hmm. um, for sale or anything Mm -hmm. like that but it's just it's a beautiful like you said it beauty at any size at Mm -hmm. any age and this is what god gave us and it's something to be celebrated and by moving it it that's just part of again showing off its beauty and and connecting with ourselves yeah for sure i agree with that yeah i love that (laughs) i love that um i could I just always have to check the time. I'm like, oh, we have to, we have to bring this to a close. Which you I and I to can do talk for many yes, hours. Yes, yes, we can. We can. <laughs> yes, um, but I will start to wrap this up. Um, okay. I know that you've written a book. Um, yes. You have. Um, I want people to know where to find you to find, you know, your practice, your books, and things like that. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. How people can find you and. Thank you. Yes. So I have three books. All three of them are on Amazon, uh, but the third one which is the most recent one, my breakup with the scale is on also on my website, which is my preference. If people can go to my website and purchase it there, it's an ebook. So www.kelaniworld.com. And my other two books, you just type in my name, Joanna Abumitri, and you can find those on Amazon. So the first book, they're, they're all wellness books. The first one is called The Bliss Buzz. And it's about finding happiness now. And the second one is called Spread Alofa, which we did talk about, and how to nurture our world with love. So thank you mm. so much for saying that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they're all wonderful topics, and I'm sure they're wonderful uh, books to read. And they're just wonderful things for us to remember that, again, if we share love with the world, but start by loving ourselves yes. and um, and just saying goodbye to that scale. I mean, I I don't own a scale. Again, I have a daughter that you know has an eating disorder so we like to keep the scale away but um Mm -hmm. even I went to um I went to the doctor I don't know a few weeks ago I don't often I'm fairly healthy so I don't often you know I don't always go for a um 
an annual physical, but I decided it's been like five years. So maybe I should go <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, maybe get some blood work and just check and make sure everything's, you know, good. And so I walked in and the um, nursing assistant, whoever was taking me to the room, she said, okay, we'll come over and, you know, weigh you. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really, I don't really want to weigh myself today. I said, I'm, I'm good. And I, I'm at a healthy weight. So mm-hmm. no issues there on no medications. So it's fine. She was accepting of that, went in there. And then as we were going through the different questions, she goes, well, do you want to give me a verbal? And I said, I don't know. Maybe this is what I weigh. I don't know. It's probably, maybe, but who cares? I don't care if it's close or not, but that's, let's put that down. Yeah. So then the doctor came in, do, does her thing and all that. And then she said, so let's go get a weight. And I, and I go, no, I'm not going to weigh myself. She goes, well, you know, they really like to have it, you know, it's just so that we can, ha-. I go, I'll give you, I gave the verbal weight. I said, there is no, again, I'm not on any medication. I mean, I'm a nurse. I'm a retired nurse. So I get it. I understand, mm-hmm. but I'm not any medication that you have to know my weight in order to calculate the dosage or anything, or I'm not overweight. I'm not in, in, in ill health. Mm-hmm. I don't see any reason why there has to be that, but she, it, I was found it interesting that the doctor, cause that's the first time that the doctor because I've done that before at other doctor's offices or whatnot. I just yeah. tell the nursing assistant, I'm not going to do it. And they're like, fine. And nobody asked me after that. But that was just, it's the only time that the doctor then questioned it too. And I'm like, hmm. it doesn't matter. I mean, it really doesn't matter. And she was, she was fine with it. But yeah. again, there are reasons, as I say, as we talk about medications or different yeah. treatments, there are times for medication. There's times for treatment. There's time for weighing yourself because it's very necessary or following a certain diet or eating certain foods or restricting certain foods. There is certainly a place for that. But mm-hmm. we're talking in general here that mm-hmm. the world is too obsessed with, like you said, what we weigh, how we look. And if we can just embrace ourselves for, for who we are. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's just so much so much better off. I agree um, with that. Yeah. So any last words as we, you know, wrap this up again, I love talking about the dance because it just, I, um, again, I love connecting with you because, um, I know I'm going to keep learning and I'm going to encourage myself to, um, you just can, cause even yes, last night at my lesson, um, as I was doing the Roomba, He's like, come on, you have to be, it comes, that's what he said. He goes, it's right here in the core. You don't slouch like you're sitting on the couch, but you're up like this. And it all comes from your core and, you know, keeping yourself tall and all that. So, yes, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, my final words would be for anyone listening that if they, if they feel that they have any issues of self-worth or self-value or a less than to look, to look for help to seek help because though we can do things alone, it's definitely easier for us to do it with a supportive community. So I definitely think that if you can find either a friend or a family member that you trust that can hold space for you and then to find a healing, I call it the healing village. So everybody will connect to a different person. You know, you said that you're doing your, your inner child work. There's, I have a brain coach. Some people are, you know, hypnotherapists. There's so many different, there's no just one modality for everybody, or maybe try a variety of different things because there's not, because we are so unique, there's not a one-stop shop for everybody. So I think it's really important. I think we did talk about this one time to just constantly seek out different people in the village because it does take a village. Historically, that's what it was. In the communal days, we were, we all gathered together. So I think it's important to, to reach out to your village and, and connect to them. And remember, as you said, that it is a practice. This is a journey. This isn't it, this isn't just like a flagpole. We talked about this as well, a flagpole of healing. You don't just get to your destination and you're good. It is a journey. It sometimes is challenging, but it's definitely rewarding. And there's definitely, I believe, a light on the other side if we have that supportive community and we decide to go into it and do it purposefully. So mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Yep. yeah, I love that. Yeah, if it's about finding, finding your tribe, I'm really thankful that I have some really close girlfriends that we, we are each other's, you know, strength and, Mm. and, um, and tribe. So I think that's super important. And again, I am so blessed to be connected with you and know you and um, really just wonderful that that universe uh, was working in our favor um, when it connected us. So thank you for sharing today. Um, Really great, valuable information um, that I know the listeners are loving. I have loved this today and (laughs) learned so much. So thank you for being here. And um, to all those listeners, again, just continue to 
again, do the work and connect yeah. with others. And just, I think it starts with, like we said, loving yourself and starting to connect there and not be afraid to go there. Mm. Again, I know they're with dance, with dance. It's been a journey that I find myself in a unfamiliar place. Mm. And yet I continue, as I said, before we went live, I continue to go back because I know that's where I need to be. I don't know where the journey is leading, but I know that it's um, a journey of healing and um, leading me to more joy in my life. And um, that's what I want. So that's why I continue on. So I encourage the listeners to, again, continue to do the same thing, keep coming back and listening to the stories, share them with others um, so that we can continue to share the the story of hope, recovery, wellness, and just living uh, the best life that we can. So thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening. If you like this podcast, head over to iTunes and leave me a five-star review. Share it with others and make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a thing. I've got a tribe over on Facebook, so head over there and search for Juggling the Chaos of Recovery Podcast Tribe. And do you know somebody who has a story, a story to share, a story of recovery and hope? Please let me know, as I'd love to feature them as a guest on one of these next upcoming podcasts. And perhaps you're looking for a community of like-minded, collaborative, and supportive people who cheer each other on as we strive to improve our lives. If that sounds like something you've been looking for, schedule some time with me. You'll find the links in the show notes. Let's talk and let me help you find your way. And I'm here to tell you that you're worth it.